subcommittee will come to order. The uh, gentleman from California has um, approved the uh, starting off without the uh, ranking member. So if the ranking member comes, he can blame it on the gentleman from California. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holloman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Longren, Mr. Cobel, members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, there is an urgent need to update uh, our federal criminal laws, and law enforcement needs new tools to find and prosecute cyber criminals. Why does the Business Software Alliance care about this issue? Several reasons. First, it hurts our member companies' businesses. Secondly, it hurts the development of electronic commerce. And third, because it hurts the economy as a whole. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for calling this hearing and for the leadership you have shown in sponsoring the pending legislation, H.R. 4175. I also want to con commend Congressman Schiff and Shabbat, uh, Mr. Longren and others, for your leadership in inter introducing H.R. 2290 earlier this year. Today's hearing could not come at a better time. We're in the midst of the holiday season, and Americans will spend nearly $30 billion in online shopping activity. They'll be able to shop at thousands of sites, compare products, services, and get prices that would have uh, been unavailable just a few years ago because of the issues of geography and comparative shopping that are brought about by the internet. At the same time, we know, studies show that many individuals are concerned about their safety about of doing business online, what the risk of criminals are who may be lurking in cyberspace, who want to steal their identity, uh, their financial records, or more. Unfortunately, these concerns are fully justified. The reality is that we use our computers at home and in the office in ways today that were unimaginable the last time there were major revisions in the federal criminal laws. This has led to a change in the nature of cybercrime, and it's changed the type of criminals. Two big changes have occurred in computing. First is the sheer growth in the number of people using computers. The second is the fact that computers are now almost always on and connected to the internet. This has given criminals the opportunity to create malicious code that can be sent out surreptitiously and can compromise thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers. This results in the creation of zombie computers that the criminal can then remotely control to carry out the attacks. The zombies may not themselves suffer monetary damage, but they may become part of an unwitting accomplices in attacking other victims of financial crimes or identity theft or denial of service. We also see that cybercrime today is overwhelmingly fueled by profit. Criminals used to write malicious code for the bragging rights. Today they do it for the money, and that is a change. What can Congress do about it? We believe that there is an urgent need to update our criminal laws to get law enforcement the tools they need to attack the changing nature of the th threat and the changing crime. We would suggest doing this in five ways. First, target botnets in ways that uh, have been identified this morning by criminalizing cyber attacks on 10 or more computers, even if they don't suffer $5,000 worth, worth of damages. Two, address new forms of cyber extortion. Three, broaden the coverage of cybercrime laws to include computers affecting interstate and foreign commerce. Fourth, attack uh, organized cybercrime by creating an explicit conspiracy to commit cybercrime as an offense. And fifth, strengthen penalties by calling for the forfeiture of computers and other equipment that are used to conduct crime and by adopting tougher sentencing guidelines. Fortunately, there is broad congressional law enforcement and industry support for such legislation. Um, there are a number of pending bills, including 2290, that address these issues. Uh, last month, the Senate adopted uh, S-2168. And finally, Mr. Chairman, your bill does that with the exception of the provision to target botnets, which we hope will be added to any final measure. Of course, H.R. 4175 has many other provisions, including data breach notification and privacy. BSA understands the seriousness of the problem. Uh, data breaches represent 
We are committed to working with this committee and with the six other committees who have jurisdiction over this legislation uh, in data breach to develop a comprehensive federal legislation. But we are very concerned that the inclusion of data breach or privacy in cybercrime legislation will delay or prevent enactment. In conclusion, we are eager to work with this committee. We believe the time is now, and we encourage moving forward and addressing and closing the loopholes that exist under today's cybercrime laws. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Holloman. Ms. Coney. Thank you, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Gomer, and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to testify on the bill, H.R. 4175, the Privacy and Cybercrime Enforcement Act. My name is Lily Coney. I'm Associate Director at the Electronic Privacy Information Center. EPIC is a nonprofit policy research center based here in Washington, D.C. We focus on privacy, civil liberties, and constitutional values. With me this afternoon is Jonathan David, a student at Northeastern Law School who assisted with the preparation of our statement. Our thanks go to the sponsors of the bill. To a great degree, the lack of transparency on data breaches, computer system breaches, anomalies, and software failures inhibits the ability of the government to proactively address computer network vulnerabilities and enforce privacy laws. The old saying that what you don't know won't hurt you has rarely held true, and when it relates to data breaches, it is never true. According to the Federal Trade Commission, for the seventh year in a row, identity theft is the number one concern of American consumers. We also know that 216 million Americans have had da data breaches impact them. The failings of private actors to manage the personally identifiable information entrusted to their care justify the passage of H.R. 4175. Further, a report from the Samuelson Clinic confirms that the private sector is willing and able to act in putting in place security measures to protect computer networks that house personally identifiable information when, that data, bre when data breaches uh, require, under stat statute, notification to consumers. We appreciate that this bill will do what the Privacy Act should have done include private data networks under the requirements to protect personally identifiable information. This is a key component for privacy protection afforded by inf fair information practices that are outlined in the Privacy Act. The provisions of the bill do not preempt state law, but rather create an important federal baseline. As we have learned, the states can respond more quickly than, federal government, than the federal government can to emerging privacy challenges. And it is very important that the federal government not limit the important work of the states in this area. The bill creates a great start on defining personally identifiable information, but more needs to be done. We are now seeing a tremendous increase in the collection of personal information in the form of biometrics, behavioral targeting, associational information, which is completely unregulated. The challenge for the committee is to create a definition that recognizes the ever-evolving risks data collection poses to privacy. EPIC endorses the bill language that requires technology protection measures that render the data elements indecipherable. We note that significant data breaches have occurred because of poor security practices or circumvention of security measures, such as removal of large quantities of data records from office locations on personal portable computer devices that were subsequently lost or stolen. Regarding the promulgation of the final privacy impact assessment, electronic records are elusive things. It may be very difficult to enforce the intent of the provisions of this statute. For example, EPIC recently discovered in the midst of our involvement in an agency proceeding before the Federal Trade Commission regarding the proposed merger, merger of Google and DoubleClick that the chair of the FTC's uh, spouse, spouse's law firm, Jones Day, represents one of the parties to the merger. Upon our making a complaint requesting the recusal of the chair from participation in the Commission's decision-making role on the merger request, 
the electronic document disappeared from the Jones Day website. This phenomenon of the disappearing electronic document is not limited to non-government internet communications. It has also been observed by EPIC and the actions taken by federal government agencies when publishing documents online. In closing, I would like to thank the subcommittee for this opportunity to speak on the record regarding the important measures set forth in H.R. 4175 and strongly endorse the efforts to address the issue of data breaches involving personally identifiable information and the efforts of the sponsors of the bill and the subcommittee to make more transparent the rulemaking process related to privacy impact assessments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Coney. I will now have questions from the uh, members, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes at this time. Uh, Mr. Laurie and Mr. McGaugh, the um, Identity Theft Penalty Enhancement Act included $10 million uh, authorized to track down identity thieves. What have you done with the money? We have <clears throat> been actively uh, pursuing identity theft cases uh, around the country. Uh, Chairman Scott, uh, in the last, between 05 and 06, identity theft cases alone increased about 22 or 23 percent from 1,500 and change to 1,900 and change. <clears throat> Many of those were under the aggravated identity fraud statute. Those numbers increased from 226 in 05 to 507 in 06. In addition, there are the Secret Service and the FBI have been establishing task forces all over the country, joining together with their federal uh, colleagues as well as local law enforcement and state law enforcement to attack identity crime at a local level and to ensure that as few of these uh, cases as possible slip through the cracks. So you, use, you are putting the $10 million to good use? Yes. Did you run out of money? <laughs> uh, I don't know if we ran out of money, but I can get back to you on that. Well, if you are tracking down cases with the money, do you have enough? The original, in the, when the bill, one of the bills uh, that the $10 million came out of, the original bill had $100 million, and we were told by the administration they didn't need any money, so we just left you 10, we, we're, 10 million got left. Um, it seems to me that we, this ought to be a high priority, and I think the committee, maybe, I can't speak for the committee, but I'd be willing to put some more authority so that you could track down more thieves, so that people would get the idea that they might get caught. Um, have you used up all of the 10 million so that we might consider increasing the authorization? Uh, I can't, as I sit here today, I can't uh, tell you whether or not we've used up all the 10 million, and I'd be happy to work with the committee and get back to you on that. Okay, now part of the, if you have limited funds, you have to make decisions so that um, you have the $5,000 threshold. Anybody stealing less than 5000 is pretty much home free. Um, what would it take, how much would it take to get cases under 5000 also on your target list? Well, I, uh, I can't tell you um, how much it would take in, in, with respect to money, if that's your question, uh, for uh, prosecution offices, the U.S. Attorney's offices around the country to lower their sh thresholds, or if the department um, would support that. I can tell you that we have used the money that we have had uh, to uh, create these regional task forces to work together uh, closely with the state uh, prosecutor's offices and state law enforcement and to train them in the investigation and prosecution of these sorts of crimes. But and the, it's pro the problem with these cases is they are, in fact, labor intensive because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And the, the information is there, but some of it might include when you find out that somebody with a stolen credit card has ordered something delivered to a post office box, you may have to have somebody sit out there until they come to pick it up. And that's, you got to pay for that. I mean, that's just hourly rate. Um, so that, um, most, many of these cases can be solved if you just had the resources. Um, and so we'll work together to find out what uh, resources you may need to lower the threshold. So somebody gets the information, they may feel they have, they're at risk of actually uh, getting caught. Now, is, um, if, if a database is breached, is mere possession of the database a crime? It, 
it depends if it's knowing. If, if uh, a database is breached and somebody extracts the information, then yes, the, uh, if it's unauthorized, if it's an unauthorized extraction, it is a crime. Is buying a social security number from some, somebody a crime before you actually, without using it? Uh, I, I don't have the statutes in front of me, but I believe under Title 44, the uh, social security statute, that, that possession, if it's with intent to commit fraud, would be a crime. But mere possession, if you buy a social security number, and that's all, all you've got, you don't know what they were going to do with it? Well, um, it's it fairly easy to prove that somebody who buys somebody else's social security number, if it's not their own, intends to commit fraud with it. But the if, answer to your question is yes. If you could not prove that element, I believe that that would, then you would not be able to satisfy the statute. Is phishing a crime? Phishing, phishing is a crime if it violates one of the statutes set forth in, in 1030, um, the elements. Do so we need to make it clear that phishing is, in fact, a crime? Uh, no, Chairman Scott, I don't think it's necessary to necessarily change the language of the bill the way you have it now to, to indicate that phishing is itself uh, a crime. Uh, the, the language that's set forth in the bill is adequate to capture uh, those types of scams with the suggestions that we've set forth here today. Now, several people have mentioned uh, whether or not just putting a cookie on somebody's computer where you can extract information without so-called damaging the computer, is that, is that not trespassing or some crime, unauthorized placing of, um, uh, of one of those cookies in somebody's computer so that you can get information? Isn't that some kind of crime? Uh, well, today? As, uh, we, what I'd like to do is is uh, is is go back and and uh, get get back to the committee on that okay. question. Certainly, it's a it sounds like a variation of a botnet the way you asked the question. But there are there are, depending the way you analyze the statute and the various elements of the statutes, it, uh, the intent of the uh, of the person who puts it there is significant. Is the, uh, there, I've heard the suggestion that you ought to be a crime if you do it to 10 computers. Is there any reason why if you do it to one computer, why that also should not be a crime? Well, it may very well be a crime uh, with in, in, under various state statutes. Uh, what we are attempting to do is bring more crimes within the purview of the federal statute, not less. So we'll, we'll be working together on, on that. Uh, gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you all. Appreciate your testimony and appreciate your patience. Um, just uh, so I'm clear on BSA's position, Ms. Tolman, uh, does BSA support a new federal law that would require mm -hmm. businesses to report uh, or to notify consumers every time a security uh, breach occurs? Mr. Chairman, we support the concept of a comprehensive federal data breach bill that would address the issue of businesses notifying consumers when there is a significant or major breach that occurs. Okay, uh, but, but my question was not whether we should have a comprehensive bill that addresses that, but whether you support actually requiring businesses to notify consumers when the breaches occur. We support notification to consumers under a properly crafted definition of what a significant breach is with other key components. For example, as one of my colleagues on the panel spoke of, if information is encrypted or redacted or otherwise stored in a fashion so that it, it's not accessible when it's breached, right. there shouldn't be a notice. We also believe that there are a number of other important provisions and an overall data security bill that that is simply one element of a number of provisions we'd like to see. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Knapp, uh, we appreciate uh, your coming forward. Uh, apparently, uh, we may not even know how many people have actually been adversely harmed as you have. And you, you uh, mentioned that the, uh, the perpetrator against you uh, 
was going to have her record wiped clean after a year and a half of uh, drug treatment, apparently. So let me ask, I, I know there's been laws like in Texas uh, where people have become so outraged about um, uh, driving while intoxicated or driving under the influence, depending on what your state calls it, uh, or negligent um, infliction of harm uh, through driving while intoxicated. And people became outraged enough, they said, all right, let's have a law. No more deferred adjudication. This is serious enough that if you commit this, then it ought to be on your record for good and you can't come out from under it. Uh, are you, uh, by bringing that up, are you actually uh, urging that we end the possibility, at least in the federal realm as far as we can, uh, end deferred adjudication where uh, it has to be on someone's record? Um, I was just referring to that my case is as it stands and, and what is happening to me. But I'm asking you were adversely affected. What do you think? Um, I personally don't think, um, you know, something like this. I think it has to do with identity theft victims in general. A lot of times in the judicial system, we are, we are not seen as victims mm. of a crime a lot of times. And in, in my case, I don't believe that I was seen as a victim. Um, when the judge at the plea hearing, um, he felt like a restitution hearing wouldn't be needed because how could I possibly hmm. have any type of out-of-pocket so. cost? Yeah. And into that, to, you know, that comment to me says, I don't see you. Um, right. and, and well, obviously, the judge didn't understand the crime. Right. Um, but it, it seems to me that uh, as we contemplate this crime, and it, what is a crime, that uh, it brings to mind some of the lessons we learned in law school about crimes of moral turpitude. And in society, we think those are more serious crimes because they involved a mens rea, they involved uh, intent. Mr. Lauer, you brought up intent a number of times. Well, a lot depends on the intent. Well, it seems to me that this ought to be one of those crimes that if you break into somebody's computer, if you get their private information, then regardless of what the intent is, uh, you know, the res ipsa loquitur ought to basically apply. The thing speaks for itself. You know, you have the intent and take that intentional aspect out of the proof that you have to put on. Uh, so, uh, I mean, think about it. It involves lying. It involves fraud, it involves theft. In some cases, like one recently a week or so ago, it involved burglary to break in and put stuff on a computer so you could track what they were doing. So uh, I, I think this hearing is a great thing and, and uh, I do think we need to make this bill uh, as tough as possible so that America understands how serious the crime is. And I would just like to ask, uh, I know Ms. Knapp, you recommended uh, requiring mandatory notification when data is breached. Uh, but let me just ask y'all, who among the witnesses has actually read this bill that we're uh, about here today? Anybody? Wow, all of you. Well, I see my red lights on with your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to just ask specifically uh, if you could quickly say if you have any specific provisions that you would like to see changed so we could make note on them and try to improve the legislation. Mr. Lowry, starting with you. And if you've got a good long list there, then I'd like the list uh, <laughs> because we're looking for ways to make it better, and that's what the hearing's for. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, our our uh, recommendation and request would be to uh, modify Section 1030A5 regarding damage to computers as we spoke about before, to add uh, language that would make it a felony if the conduct affected 10 or more computers, and also to make it a misdemeanor for damage uh, under $5,000, anywhere between zero and $5,000. We would uh, recommend uh, uh, modifications to Section 1028 and 1028A to define persons to include corporations so that the stealing of identity of a corporation, often used in phishing schemes, uh, would also be a crime under 1028. We would also uh, add certain crimes to the list that would be predicates for the aggravated felony under 1028A, and we've provided those uh, in our papers. Uh, we would ask for a, um, 
uh, modification to 1030A7, which is the extortion statute, uh, uh, to uh, enable that statute to reach uh, threats to do, uh, to release, for, for example, to release information that had already been stolen. The way that the, the the uh, statute is drafted now, it covers threats to do damage, but not necessarily threats related to damage already done. So we believe that the statute needs a little bit of tweaking there. Um, we have some suggestions uh, for the forfeiture section uh, to include uh, real property and, and to change the language in one of the prongs from proceeds to gross proceeds. Uh, and finally, and perhaps um, most significantly, um, we request um, changes uh, or uh, directives to the Sentencing Commission to focus not just on sentences in general, but certain specifics, uh, which would include uh, defining a victim as not just somebody who suffers monetary loss, but somebody uh, who suffers an invasion of privacy. And that relates to some of the topics that have already been discussed at this hearing today. Uh, and in any event, it is hard to value uh, information stolen. Mm. Uh, we finally, with respect to the Sentencing Commission, uh, would request that they be directed to uh, look into um, um, the aggravating factors that are already there or the enhancements that are already in the statute, that they be accumulated instead of now applying whether they're the greatest of, is the language that's, that's now used. Uh, we would also uh, suggest an enhancement or that the Sentencing Commission look uh, at whether there should be an enhancement for uh, disclosure of information stolen, because it is a separate harm, and in some senses maybe even more significant harm, once information is stolen, to disclose it, depending on how many people uh, it's disclosed to. Uh, so thank you for that thank opportunity. You. And we've got five more, and I don't want to exceed my time that much. If I could ask the witnesses to, uh, if you could submit in writing any suggestions you have for changes to the legislation. That would be greatly appreciated, and, and that would include all of you, including Mr. Lowry, if you think of anything else. But thank you so much. Thank you. The gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's been said, we appreciate you all being here. Mr. Holloman, I think you responded to Mr. Gomer's question uh, regarding uh, notifying consumers under a properly crafted statute. Would you also require support the requirement that business notify law enforcement? That's an extra thing. Stealing is one of the crimes of taking and possessing another one. Mr. Coble, I appreciate your follow-up question on that. Um, I think the, yes, the answer is we would support the uh, requirement that businesses notify law enforcement when there is a breach. And I think there's probably greater clarity in terms of our support for that um, again, it's with the, the, the caveats that it needs to define what a significant breach is. It needs to ensure that there's not notification if it is unnecessary. And we believe that, um, but the principle we think is worthwhile. We would hope that that is addressed, however, part of a comprehensive data breach bill. Thank you, thank you sir. Mr. Winston, what steps does the FTC take to make sure that businesses adequately protect personal information from identity thefts. No, no, but this is a target. We go about this, company. We go about this in, in several ways, uh, beginning with law enforcement. As I mentioned in my testimony, we've, we've brought 15 law enforcement cases now against companies that yeah. failed to reasonably protect consumer data, in most cases leading to a data breach. Um, and in addition to law enforcement, we also do a lot of consumer uh, business education and outreach. Uh, we've published uh, educational materials. We're going to be holding regional seminars for, for, for businesses so that they understand what their obligations are and they understand what the consequences are if, if they don't meet their obligations. Thank you, sir. Uh, are laws, uh, Mr. Winston, requiring <coughs> protection of personal information limited to certain industries or certain sectors such as banking or other financial industries? Yes, that's correct. Um, there are a number of uh, data security laws that apply to different kinds of data or different kinds of industries. The financial services industry is one. The healthcare industry is another. Um, as part of the uh, Identity Theft Task Force recommendations, 
we have supported a national data security law that would apply across the board to any business that maintains personal information. We think that there should be one rule. Thank you, sir. Ms. Knapp, how can we assist in improving restitution for identity, identity theft victims? Um, thank you, sir, for that question. Um, I think um, what you're doing with um, allowing uh, victims to count their time is very important. I think this is the first time that we, we've actually seen some of that because time is so much um, of, of what we deal with. Now, now, fortunately, I've never been a victim. How does one fairly and if possibly easily restore one's credit record after having been a victim? Um, that one is each victim. Probably can't be done easily. Um, in, in my opinion, it, it, is, it is difficult. It, there are barriers and, and um, things, and each person's victimization is different. Um, but the, the journey is not an easy one, I can tell you that. Well, again, thank you all for being here. Mr. Chairman, note that I'm yielding back before the red light illuminates. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Coble. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Lundgren. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I didn't know whether uh, the ranking member needed more time for his questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's between you and the ranking member. <laughs> Thank you for yielding. At this time, I, I would. Uh... Uh, well, it must be a Texas thing. Um, uh, the representative of, um, of the Justice Department and also uh, the gentleman representing the uh, FTC, I, I'm, I'm concerned about this whole area, uh, particularly of identity theft. And if we enact legislation, I would like to ensure that it actually works. And one of the things that strikes me on the bill that we have before us is that uh, it acts a little differently than some other laws that I'm, I'm aware of, which is that when uh, the Congress um, preempts state law, it then gives the state AGs the authority to assist in the enforcement of federal statutes. This bill is drafted, as I understand it, allows that, but does no preemption uh, at all. Is that unusual in the law in your experience, or is that something that we see somewhere else? Well, with respect to uh, our experience, I'd be happy to get back to the committee on, on other areas where we've seen this. I, I will note that in the, uh, the task force strategic report, which is uh, co-chaired by the department, they did recommend that type of preemption. See, see, my concern is we are creating a lot of criminalization of activity on a federal level, and yet I wonder whether we have the resources to follow through with it truly. And therefore, is this really an attempt to create a federal statute of criminal sanctions, but with the expectation that it will truly be enforced by the states instead of the feds? And if we're going to do that, we ought to know about that. But it seems to me a little different than we've done before. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are other areas of the law. Maybe the gentleman from the FTC can help me on this. Um, as Mr. Lurie said, uh, the Identity Theft Task Force, in some of its recommendations, particularly with regard to the oh, I, and look, look, I understand they may have suggested it. I'm asking, is this a precedent? Or is this something that we found in other areas of the law? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I think out. there are a number of laws that provide for federal preemption but allow for state attorney general enforcement. The Fair Credit Reporting Act is one. Um, so it, it, that model is, I think, not uncommon. But where we have no preemption here but still extending that. Well, I, that I'm not as sure about. I know okay. there well, are. Okay. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. If you could help me in, in, in looking at that and submitting that for the record. Um, Title II of the legislation. Um, authorizes uh, a civil action with um, civil penalties up to $500,000 or $1 million if it's intentional from any business entity, it says from any business entity that engages in conduct that constitute a violation of federal law relating to data security. Um, if you've had a chance to look at the bill, do you think that limits it to 
for profit entities only, or th would that be not for profit as well? And how would you look at it from the Justice Department standpoint? Um, uh, I'm appearing here as a, a member of the criminal division, so I did not scrub uh, okay. the, uh, the civil sections of the bill, but we'd be happy to review that and get back to you on our opinions about whether or not it would cover both those types of entities. Okay, I'm trying to sort of figure out where we are in here because I want a statute that works, but I also want one that, that doesn't just sit on the books and we think it's going to work. Or, frankly, if we pass federal laws that are primarily being enforced by federal authorities, to me that's extremely important. Um, but it's more difficult for us to have oversight if what we're doing is passing federal laws that are going to be absolutely, if not um, uh, exclusively, or primarily, if not exclusively, um, prosecuted at the state level. And I wonder if there are implications uh, with respect to constitutional authority in that. Um, the way I read the bill, and I would ask you if this seems to make sense, because we can certainly change it, it looks like it provides an across-the-board maximum penalty of 20 years for all violations of Section 1030 of Title 18. Now, unless I miss something, that could be interpreted as meaning that failure to notify breaches would carry a harsher penalty for the businesses than for the ID thieves themselves. Uh, to me, that doesn't sound like a proper priority. Um, would you agree with that, or is that something that you think makes sense? I, um, I believe the way the bill was was uh, drafted, um, it provides for a five-year penalty, maximum penalty for the failure to notify. Okay. So, so your answer is that's what you would uh, want rather than the way I, I thought it was written. I, I have a lot more questions, but I would like to respect my time limits and uh, would yield back. That's that's a novel concept in this subcommittee, but. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen from Ohio. I thank the chairman for yielding. Um, Mr. Uh, Holliman, uh, news reports indicate that crimes committed via computers are becoming increasingly uh, prevalent, and I'm, I know that's what we've been discussing today, with as many as uh, 10 million uh, computers falling victim uh, to hackers. Um, FBI Director uh, Mueller is quoted as saying that, quote, botnets are the weapon of choice for cyber criminals, unquote. Um, how urgent is it that we pass cybercrime legislation, and can we afford uh, to wait on cybercrime legislation while we address other problems with uh, Internet security? Uh, Mr. Chabot, thank you for the question. I think that it is uh, imperative and urgent to pass cybercrime legislation. I think there is broad agreement um, in both houses of Congress and across the aisle in terms of what loopholes need to be closed. Uh, your um, question is correct that the growth in botnets um, is an enormous problem, and that is bringing um, law-abiding citizens unwittingly into the process in which their computers are being hijacked and used to perpetrate crime. Um, it may slow down their computer. It may be a nuisance for them, but they don't really know what's happening, and we should not require that um, law enforcement be required to show that there is $5,000 worth of damage to take action in that case. So we believe the problem is immediate, it's growing, there is a solution, and we hope that Congress moves quickly on this. Thank you. And are legislative uh, efforts enough? Um, and, and what can uh, consumers and, and businesses do uh, to protect themselves uh, to minimize the threat of uh, cybercrime? <laughs> Well, legislation um, is a key part, but it's not um, by itself the sole solution. Um, there are public awareness uh, activities that are underway through the FTC and other agencies to build awareness of this. There are private sector efforts that provide checklists to business owners of what type of security products they need to deploy and security procedures. Um, and finally, there are uh, joint partnerships between industry and law enforcement uh, the National Cyber Forensic 
Training Alliance in Pittsburgh is just such an organization. BSA supports that, as do many in industry. They collect data on cybercrime, share that information with law enforcement, and assist in helping with the prosecution. So it takes a combined effort of which legislation uh, is only one component, but it's an essential component. Thank you very much. And, Mr. Chairman, as uh, my colleague from uh, North Carolina did, I would be happy to yield back my time at this time in the interest of the rest of the committee. Thank, thank I could you. divide it between the gentleman from Texas and the gentleman from California here, but I think I'll just yield back. Well, we'll, 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 we'll see. The gentlelady from Texas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you, Mr. Conyers, and the other co-sponsors for moving forward on uh, what will continue to grow to be um, maybe in some minds an insurmountable problem as we become more technological and uh, the sophistication of the technology that we use becomes more finite, uh, certainly, uh, and more broadly utilized. It seems that uh, privacy uh, in the midst of innovation uh, is a stepchild. And I think that the Congress has a duty uh, to ensure, um, as uh, the Ninth Amendment instructed us to do, to not forget privacy, but also the abuse of too much information, identity theft, and otherwise. With the good comes the bad, with benefit comes the burden. Uh, so, Mr. McGaw, as it relates to um, the potential crime that may come about uh, through the misuse of this technology, cybersecurity, um, my question would be the ability and the need, if you will, to ensure coordination between all levels of law enforcement. Um, even if you're speaking of, for example, in Houston, Texas, um, uh, what we call um, layered uh, police work, we have like a constable that has a jurisdiction maybe of 750,000 to 800,000. Uh, those are individuals that are closer to the constituents. They are the ones who do the eviction work and otherwise. But again, um, they are right there on the ground. And we have sheriffs, we have police officers. Of course, we have um, the um, FBI and, of course, the U.S. Secret Service and, and just a number of layers. So I'd be interested in that. I'd be interested for Ms. Coney and welcome uh, to uh, again establish for us how significant a problem is this whole issue of the invasion of our privacy. How, you know, give us, uh, if you will, the broadness of the problem and the, the depth of the problem, uh, if you will. And I have another question, but let me yield to Mr. McGaugh. Thank you very much. Um, we partner very well with state and local law enforcement uh, as well as federal agencies, and we realize the importance of sharing information on different cases that we are working. Uh, quite frankly, across the country, we have 29 different financial crimes task forces and 24 electronic crime task forces. Those task forces are built on sharing of information, not only with law enforcement, with the private sector, as well as the academic community. I feel the sharing of the information that we have and we do um, addresses those concerns that you have um, very well. And, and in, uh, let me just expand a little bit more. Are you in constant communication with local law enforcement? Um, maybe I missed it. Are there task forces that are addressing this question? Yes. Uh, on all of our task forces, financial crimes task forces, as well as electronic task forces, state and local law enforcement are key partners in, in those task forces. Uh, so that information is disseminated through them to back to their department so that we're uh, coordinating our efforts to address uh, identity theft. Uh, Ms. Coney. Thank you, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. This is probably the most significant part of why data breach is even being considered by this committee. Millions of records of individuals are online or available through electronic transfer. The question is whether it is the victim's responsibility or whether it is the data holder's responsibility to manage control of that information. You have to remember, victims are in damage control mode. They have no idea that they've been attacked until they get notice. When they get notice, they can react. Unfortunately, the notice is usually coming because they've gotten, they've gotten some communication through the mail, have gotten hand, got, looked at their credit report, and that's when they know that someone has appropriated their identity and literally stolen in their names. It takes hundreds of hours sometimes just to correct that information, and the mental anxiety and the stress that comes with that is very difficult for people who have not been victimized to even understand. Those who are in possession of the data 
have an obligation, a moral obligation, and it should be a legal obligation to inform people when these things occur. Now, the jurisdiction of this committee limits what you can do in that regard. You can hold data owner, data managers, because the data owners are really the people whose information they're, they're controlling. Make them responsible for reporting to a government agency. That agency, in turn, will report through the Federal Register a list of those entities who have had their data compromised. I think this is a reasonable approach. The numbers of vic victims, 260 million Americans, have been impacted by loss of data. It's, it's appropriate and, and definitely. Is that in this legislation, what you've just recommended? Yeah, it, it, yes, it is. The part that requires those entities that suspect that their data has been compromised must report to the Secret Service the compromise. And the Secret Service, in turn, once a year, will publish in the Federal Register a list of those entities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just comment and, and uh, highlight Section 102 that provides criminal penalties for those who don't provide uh, the uh, notice of a security breach. Uh, and finally, might I say, what we don't have yet, uh, which we expect to have in the next uh, couple of years, is electronic reporting of medical records. Once we add that large component required to the system, putting all medical facilities and physicians online, we have an enhanced opportunity for abuse. And so I hope this legislation will move through this committee and move to the floor and have the President's signature. I yield back. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for their testimony. Um, members may have additional questions to um, ask, and if uh, we'll submit those to you in writing, and we'd appreciate it if you could respond as soon as possible so the um, uh, answers can be part of the record. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for one week for the submission of additional materials. The chairman of the Commercial and Administrative Law Subcommittee has uh, offered a statement. Um, she has reminded us that the, some of the parts of the bill come under the jurisdiction of her subcommittee as well as most of it in this subcommittee, and so she has an interest in, um, in this legislation. Without, um, yeah. gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was made aware that there may have been a study that actually uh, deals with how often businesses notify uh, consumers of, of breach or loss of data, and uh, is that right, Mr. Lowry? Uh, it's not a it's not a government study, but there has been a study done. Okay, could you direct us to that and the information to follow? Yes, I will provide that information. Okay, thank and, you. And does does that study indicate how often uh, criminal activity takes place after a breach? Uh, I don't. I don't know if it does. The only. The only thing I know about the study is is that. Uh, and again, this is not a government study that we cannot say with any degree of certainty whether it's it's accurate. Um, but uh, the only thing I know about the study, as I sit here and will provide it to you, is that uh, uh, they estimate that uh, approximately 30 percent of uh, breaches are reported by victims. Thank you. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.